Hey church, and welcome to this week's small group. And if you were here on Sunday, we, you know that we started a series called Preparing for Easter. And in this series, what we're looking at is how Jesus prepared people for Easter. In the service, we're looking at how Jesus was preparing the rest of the world for Easter. But in small group, we're going to be looking at how Jesus prepared his disciples for Easter. So before we jump into the passages here, I, I want to let you know the background. Jesus had made promises that he was going to build this brand new kingdom. But at the same time, he also started talking about how he was going to die. And those two different statements seem so contradictory. Jesus, how are you going to build a kingdom if you're going to die? Everyone knew at this point that the Pharisees were out to at least harm Jesus. We actually find out that they were, they were looking to kill him. And at this point, Jesus was not hiding anymore. And so with that background in mind, I want you to read John chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. And what I want you to notice is that verses 4 through 5 are Jesus' reaction to all that was mentioned in verses 1 through 3. So you read 1, 1 through 3 and it was like, man, Jesus is going through all of this and this and this. And so as a result, verses 4 and 5 happen. So why do you think Jesus took this particular moment to wash his disciples' feet? And why was Jesus washing their feet such a big deal? What I want you to notice is that in verses 1 through 3, it's like you can cut the tension with a knife. You know, Jesus' ministry, he had accomplished everything he needed to accomplish. He knew that, that uh, he was going to be betrayed by Judas. And he knew that the end was near. I mean, all that tension was there. And so as a result, Jesus decides that he needs to prepare his disciples for a time to be without him. See, washing of feet was a need back in those days. You know, we have closed-toed shoes and we've got streets, like paved streets, that, that don't get our feet all dirty when we walk on them. But back then, their feet could get really nasty just walking from one, one house to another house. And so as a result, when you would go into someone else's house, you needed to have your feet washed. And most people would just have a basin by the door with a little bit of water and you would wash your own feet. But for people who had a little bit more money or for people who had servants, you would usually get your lowliest servant to wash the feet of your visitors. In fact, washing uh, your, you know, other people's feet, they wouldn't even let Jewish servants do it. They, they would make servants from some distant land wash feet. And so it was quite a surprise when Jesus, not a servant, not a disciple, but the leader, the teacher, the Son of God, is getting on his hands and knees and washing feet. Man, that's something that the lowest of servants is supposed to do. What I want you to do is read John chapter 13, verses 6 through 17. Why was it so difficult for Peter to allow Jesus to wash his feet? Do you find it hard or difficult to let someone serve you? And finally, if Jesus expected Peter to allow someone to serve him, do you think that Jesus expects the same from us? And why? I don't know about you, but I'm a lot like Peter in that I have a hard time letting other people serve me. And that's a problem. You know, sometimes I even have a problem when somebody comes and compliments me. Hey, Todd, you did a great job. And, you know, I feel like I have to deflect that. Like, oh, well, it was all Jesus or, you know, I'm so horrible. You know, I don't feel comfortable accepting that. But Jesus expects us to let others serve us. In fact, when we don't let others serve us, we rob them of the joy of being like Jesus. You know, that, that, that's, that's a really good quote. And in fact, uh, I'll have Jesse put it up on the screen right now. When we don't let others serve us, we rob them of the joy of being like Jesus. 
man, that's tweetable. You can tweet that if you want. And the second thing that I want you to see here is that church is deeper than we think it is. Let's continue. What was the point that Jesus was trying to make with this illustration? What was it that Jesus was getting at? And why don't we wash each other's feet in church today? The point that Jesus was trying to make is that he wants us to humble ourselves. Remember a couple weeks ago, Wesley preached out of Philippians chapter 2, which says, consider others better than yourselves. We're supposed to elevate others and humble ourselves. Now, why don't we wash each other's feet in church today? Well, I've actually seen some churches that do that, and, and that's okay, I, as long as it's symbolic. But to take this story and to just take it as, okay, we should wash each other's feet and make it a regular part of church, man, I think that cheapens what Jesus was trying to teach. Jesus wasn't telling us to literally wash each other's feet. What he was trying to tell us is we need to serve each other in creative ways that matter, things that mean stuff to each other. So I want to challenge you as a church to do that with each other. We need to serve one another. Next, I want you to read John chapter 13, verses 18 through 30. Why was it important that Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him? And the second question, which is kind of a minefield, was Judas guilty of a free will decision to betray Jesus? Or was he a victim of fate? Have a good time with that one. It's important for us to know that Jesus knew about Judas' betrayal beforehand because we need to understand that nothing takes God by surprise. Right? There was a, a commercial not too long ago. It was an insurance commercial where uh, the guardian angel keeps slacking for this one particular guy. You know, and wherever he goes, you know, the guardian angel is like, oops, didn't see that one coming. Well, that's not what happens with God. God doesn't miss things. He knows beforehand. And if we were to ask that really hard question, well, was Judas guilty or not? Judas was absolutely guilty. He made that decision of his own free will. He did it on his own. You know, Satan may have entered into him when he was handed the bread, but the simple fact is, is that Judas had invited Satan into his heart long before he sat down for dinner that night. But what I love about this is that it shows that God can even take the most horrible decisions of humankind and He can use them to accomplish His purposes. Nothing can stop God from accomplishing what He wants to accomplish. Next, I want you to read John chapter 13, verses 31 through 38. And what I want you to do is discuss in depth within your group verses 34 and 35. What do these verses mean to you? And what do verses 34 and 35 look like in our culture and in our church today? It doesn't necessarily mean washing each other's feet. So what does it mean and what does it look like? I think each of us is going to have to answer that question. That's a hard question to answer. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not 100% sure, but I can tell you this. Verses 34 and 35 are so much more than just passing by each other on our way in and on our way out of church. Like We have got to learn how to love each other the way Jesus wanted us to love each other. You see, church is deeper than we think it is. Next, I want you to read verses 34 through 35 again. And they're so beautiful when you read them, but then Peter and Jesus seem to mess it up in verses 36 through 38 when it's predicted that, that Peter is going to betray Jesus. Are they really messing up the message of verse 34 through 35?
I believe that they aren't messing up the message. In fact, they are demonstrating what true love looks like. Guys, this is the real world, and the reality of the situation is that loving each other is messy. And sometimes we're going to have to deal with lying or betrayal or all the mess that goes along with our humanity. But the fact is, is when we love each other through all of that, man, it gets really deep and it means something. You see, church is deeper than we think it is. Last couple questions. What are some of the ways that loving each other might get messy at the Pulse of Miami Church? And the second question, why is loving people in the midst of their mess better than loving people who have it all together? And after you finish those two questions, close in prayer and just ask that God would teach us to love one another in our church. God bless you guys and have a great rest of the week.